Alan Bolton, you are the former editor at large at Sky News. You are now a Times Radio presenter. We're going to talk about the Gary Lineker tweet, the BBC and the fallout. What are you going to tell me? I'm going to tell you that there are real pressures on impartiality uh, in uh, television, but it's worth preserving and that uh, probably uh, Tim Davey, the director general, went a bit too far, but he's U-turned. I guess I want to start with a very simple, quick question, which was, has anyone won in all of this? between Gary Lineker, the BBC? Well, I think it's a battle because we'll have to see what happens in future. But for now, I think uh, Gary Lineker has clearly won. The odd thing is, I don't think he actually was looking for a battle at all. I think he just wanted to express his opinions on another medium and got embroiled with the BBC. And certainly they've had to back down, reinstate him. I guess, firstly, what did you make of his initial tweet where he wrote, this is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s and I'm out of order. My feeling is there's a a problem now, which is that no one works exclusively for anyone because whoever you work for, you also have the opportunity to have a social media presence, which is encouraged. So I would tend uh, to see what Gary Lineker does or what indeed another light entertainment or a BBC actor does. I think you just have to take that as being separate from what they're doing at the BBC and make sure, please it, that they... Uh, maintain impartiality in the work uh, at the BBC. And frankly, that's the line that the BBC seemed to be following with other people, you know, Andrew Neil, Alan Sugar. And it was just odd, uh, in a sense, that because there was such a pile in by the Daily Mail and people on the right of the Conservative Party, that the BBC appeared to buckle. Management would say they weren't responding to that backlash from the papers or the government. But do you think there is a question there given the fact that, you know, there was a number of days between when the tweet was sent to when they decided to ask him to step back. I think there was a delay because they were considering it. And I think it was because the momentum built up on the right that they felt they had to respond. I mean, the management saying that uh, they didn't take notice of what was going on elsewhere is very BBC. But it also has to be untrue, doesn't it? Because uh, in the end, the management, certainly the director general, is responsible for maintaining the company and if he feel a corporation rather and if he feels under pressure politically that this is endangering the reputation of the bbc because there is a hostile political entity out there he has to cope with that so i I can understand it's a sort of slightly pompous defensive move saying oh no this was my own decision but it just can't be true do you think the bbc invited it on themselves as well because i mean they themselves started leading on it as you know a bulletin on the news at 10. They seem to make it a story themselves as well. I was absolutely stunned that the BBC were leading with it when no one else was, frankly. You know, the BBC does have an enormous institutional self-regard. And um, I don't think it was a story of national interest. And of course, what it managed to do uh, was mean that discussion of what the government was proposing, what was in Suella Braverman's proposals, took, in the end, second place everywhere uh, to... Uh, what was happening at the BBC. And I think that was a a, a strange news judgment, let's put it that way. Because, you know, when you discuss what Lineker tweeted, looking at the the social media guidelines, which Tim Davey sort of updated in 2020, whereas before, you know, and it still says this, you know, the risk of being impartial was lower where an individual was expressing views publicly on an unrelated area. For example, a sports or science presenter expressing views on politics or arts. He added this so-called Lineker clause, right, that says there are also others who are not journalists or involved in factual programming who nevertheless have an additional responsibility to the BBC because of their profile on the BBC. Do you think that was a right change to the guidelines, which, of course, are now being looked at? Well, again, I think it's a bit mealy-mouthed, to be honest. I, I do feel that to single someone out because they are the most successful people, I I don't think that is a good uh, employment policy. I would also say this particular problem about Gary Lineker, because I don't think he's primarily famous because he presents match of the day. I think he's famous because he was a world-class footballer and played in World Cups uh, and, and has opinions. And so for the BBC to imply that his profile on Twitter is entirely down to match of the day, I think is a nonsense. The immediate issue around Gary Lineker has now been resolved, or at least postponed, while the BBC conducts a review into its social media guidelines. Many have called this an own goal by the BBC and a win for Gary Lineker. 
but the newspapers that initially criticised Lineker for his tweet have responded angrily to the apparent U-turn by the BBC. The Mail called it a slap in the face for licence payers, and the Express asked whether this actually had put a nail in the coffin for the licence fee. But questions remain about the conduct of Tim Davey and the ongoing position of the chairman of the BBC, Richard Sharp, who's donated money to the Conservative Party in the past, used to work with Rishi Sunak, and acted as a go-between for a loan guarantee to Boris Johnson, and didn't disclose that involvement during his recruitment process for the BBC position. Impartiality is at the heart of Tim Davey's mission, and that means a lot of scrutiny is also placed on his past as an unsuccessful Conservative candidate for local council in the 1990s. I can tell you, anyone who knows me knows that, yes, 30 years ago, some political involvement, but absolutely not affected by pressure from one party or the other. That is not how we work editorially in the BBC. Um, it's a convenient narrative, it's not true. Richard Sharp has repeatedly said that he did not advise Boris Johnson or have detailed knowledge of the former Prime Minister's finances. A spokesperson for Boris Johnson said, Richard Sharp has never given any financial advice to Boris Johnson, nor has Mr Johnson sought any financial advice from him. I spoke to Adam about impartiality and its meaning and importance in today's media. Can you yourself, as someone who's been in this business for a long time, define impartiality for me? I think impartiality, uh, first of all, involves in your broadcasting or what you do for the BBC, uh, reflecting wherever possible both sides of an argument uh, and doing that also in the people you interview, the talent that you book. And I think it should avoid endorsing a particular political party. And I, I can see that, you know, the gray area that um, Gary Lineker might have got into was that he criticized the government policy. I mean, he didn't say vote Labour. <laughs> um, um, and I also think that the people handling the politically sensitive material, in other words, news journalists, they're the ones who I think do have to have tighter, tighter controls in, 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 in what they say. And certainly in my work, I have always, you know, fallen over myself, not both in my mind and in my work, not to take sides and to try, you know, I think our first job is to explain what politicians are doing and why, and then to analyze the possible fallout from it. That said, and this is where I think it gets difficult, mm. I've always seen my work as a political journalist as being, oddly enough, analogous to being a sports commentator. Yeah. In other words, I reserve the right to say, this policy has a lot of flaws or the government is in a mess or this minister is going to resign in the same way as I would saying, you know, this football team needs a, needs a new back row and is probably going to get relegated. I think, you know, I think that's fair comment provided you are prepared to do it about everybody. Because, you know, at, at the moment, the issue is that there is a concern from critics, which Tim Davey would deny that because of Tim Davey's background as someone who ran unsuccessfully to be a Conservative councillor, and given Richard Sharp and his clear ties to the Conservative Party, that that is having an impact on the BBC decision making. How damaging if, if you, you know, as a political journalist, were in that situation where that perception existed? Because that must be quite damaging for those who might be working there. Well, I've got to be careful here because I know both of them. Yep. And I admire both of them, frankly. I think, I, I, from what I know of them, I think they're people of integrity. In the case of Richard Sharp, I think the problems created about him being, direct, uh, being chairman of the BBC are not his fault, but at some point, I think he, he should have seen that they were there. First of all, I think it has been a, from the point of view of a broadcaster, uh, regrettable that Boris Johnson has kind of weaponized government appointments to the extent that he has. And, you know, first of all, he was recommending Charles Moore and then uh, he let it be known, whereas previous Prime Ministers have not let yeah. it be known who their favoured candidate was. So I think that's unfortunate. As far as Tim Davey is concerned, I see no evidence that his past, you know, relatively modest party political involvement has influenced 
the way he's running the BBC any more than the fact that um, Nick Robinson was mm -hmm. chairman of the Young Conservatives at university influences Nick. I don't think it does influence. It, but is there an argument to say that the last few days have shown that maybe it does? If it, if the if the perception is that he is responding, I would say I would guess that Tim David was not seeking this, mm -hmm. and in dealing with it, um, he didn't feel under any obligation uh, to the government and the Conservative Party, but I would say he possibly judged that this was a pressure that he'd be wise to accede to in the broader interests of the BBC. And I think that has turned out to be a miscalculation given where the strength of public opinion uh, behind Gary Lineker. Do you think in his drive for impartiality, um, given the fact that in the last few days he's only done two interviews for the BBC itself, should one move be for someone like a Tim David to actually open himself up to ITV News, Sky News, Channel 4 News to defend his, his manoeuvrings and to defend his judgment on what impartiality means? Yes, absolutely. I think that's been a major mistake. Um, I've worked with companies associated with um, Rupert Murdoch, for example, and for many years, Rupert Murdoch had a policy that when he did interviews, he wouldn't do it with one of his own companies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's slightly changed of late. But also, I've interviewed previous uh, director generals, uh, Tony Hall, though slightly odd being in the BBC and kind of man marked and literally told you can stand there, but you can't stand there or whatever. Um, no, I think, I, think it, I think it has looked like a mistake. I know you said you have to be careful in terms of what you say about Mr. Davy, but you, you know, we were saying there's a difference between impartiality and due impartiality. And Ofcom says, you know, due impartiality means the Jew means adequate or appropriate to the subject and nature of the program. I mean, going back to the Gary Lineker tweet, something which I don't seem to understand is that within Jew impartiality, it's the whole remit of a story over several days, whatever. Why, why does the BBC seem to have thought that that one tweet tilted that Jew impartiality in terms of their whole Well, I, I, would, I would say you don't have to look further than the front pages of the Daily Mail and the um, cabinet ministers and ex-cabinet ministers demanding action. I think, I, I think that was why they looked at it. Whereas, you know, when Alan Sugar said vote Tory on his tweet, um, he didn't get a lot of protest from the incumbent government. Because then that comes to the point about the perception that Tim Davey has come in and said, there is an impartiality problem. Richard Sharp gave an interview to The Times and talked about, you know, a liberal bias within the BBC. But if you look at something like... Um, the Reuters Institute's digital news report from last year, which looks into trust. The BBC trust was at 55%, distrust at 26%, and said that public broadcasters such as the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, remain the most trusted news brands. Was there ever an impartiality crisis at the BBC? Is this not a perception of I, certain news? I think it's something you have to be aware of, but I feel that um, to a certain extent, it's been a mistake to pander to that. Mm. And, and, you know, I certainly know, for example, Andrew Neil, when he was employed at the BBC, he was regarded to a certain extent as a shield against criticism of its impartiality because by his record and his association with The Spectator, he clearly be on to the right. And I think it's, it, it's absolutely right to balance um, uh, your you know, your, your political team and have people who people may feel uh, that they have different views. But I, at, at the same time, I mean, Sky also, Sky News also did well on, on, on those trust surveys. And, yeah. and, you know, I have been attacked from people saying, you know, on the one hand, you know, you're a public school Oxbridge white man, you're obviously a Tory, and on the other hand saying, well, your wife used to work for Tony Blair, so you're obviously Labour. You have to be prepared for that mm. uh, because there's only a value if you go that bit further in challenging the orthodoxy of, of any particular position. But that only works if people trust your organisation. Mm. And I feel, and I know, you know, some conservative politicians I've spoken to, I feel that attacking the integrity of the BBC is wrong. In a hypoth hypothetical world where you were a political journalist working for the BBC right now, would you find it difficult to do your job given the, the, the belief amongst some out there in the public now about Mr. Davy and Mr. Sharp that that would, that would call into question your own impartiality? 
Um, no, because I would say, you know, they're not they're not running the programs. Where I think the difficulty comes is that there is an increasing willingness of politicians to play the man, to play the journalist, mm. to sort of say, oh, well, I'm not going to talk to you because, you know, you're, you're biased or all that. And, and even, you know, to go online and tweet themselves that they think you're biased or there's no justification for, for what you're saying. Um, and that, I think, you know, is quite intimidating in the end. And, and you know, we are seeing a growth of more partisan media, things like uh, GB News and others, where they clearly have a friendship group with a certain mm. aspect of politicians and, and, and a non-friendship group with another. And I probably as the various outlets multiply, that's probably inevitable, but I think it's something that has to be watched very, very closely indeed. And I would say that what I regard as the mainstream broadcasters have to be very careful that they maintain their level of trust mm. with the public, which is by being trying to be fair and impartial. Now, earlier we mentioned how newspapers like the Daily Mail and the Express were angry at the BBC's rollback on the Lineker story. But the interesting thing also was, take the Express story that questioned the licence fee. In that article, the first two Tory MPs expressing their disquiet about impartiality were Jacob Rees-Mogg and Philip Davies, two Conservative MPs who are now presenters on GB News, a news channel where one of the founders said its mission was to serve the views of the majority of British people and not the narrow London elites as seen by the BBC and other news channels. Over on Talk TV, the former Culture Secretary and critic of the BBC, Nadine Dorries has a show, as does Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform Party. Elsewhere, David Lammy, who sits on the Labour shadow bench, has an LBC show. In this mission for impartiality from the BBC, the rest of the broadcasting world seems to be being muddled, more partisan, more confrontational. Is that a good thing or is it more worrying? I want to move on now to talk about the change in broadcasting and in news that's happened recently and that you've written about. And you've actually written about the growing list of presentitions. Yes, yeah, it's a hard word to pronounce, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, as lines sort of blur between broadcast news and campaigning politicians. Can you just go into why that causes you concern? Well, it causes me concern because I think it eats away at the integrity of what I regard as important, which is providing impartial news. But, you know, in the way it's evolving, you've got Nigel Farage or Jacob Rees-Mogg presenting, or Nadine Dorries presenting television programmes who make no secret of, of where they're coming from politically. And they are on things called news channels. And I think it gets quite difficult to, for the viewer to really see the difference between them and, you know, Kay Burley or Tom Bradby or, or, or something like that. And that, I think, makes, devalues our work because we get into all these arguments about where, where, where the bias is coming from. Mm. I also think that it gives money more power in our media than it's ever had before, because by and large, the money is coming from people on the right to fund people on the right to broadcast. And, you know, there is a certain appeal for that. But, you know, I, I think that, that that should be a cause for concern if we believe. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name the channel, but one channel I've done some work for, they sort of said, well, you know, we don't want you anymore because you're a centrist. In other words, you know, what they were looking for was a Corbynite arguing with a Borisite. You know, that was that was what they regarded as political coverage. Where And, and I, I, you know, I... I, I just don't think that's um, a very constructive way of looking at the world, even if it has kind of clickbait appeal um, to see people shouting at each other on television to a limited extent. Is that going back to a sort of idea of a devaluing of, of again, due impartiality versus impartiality? Sort of saying, well, actually, the way I do this is there's one person, another person, rather than a more coherent way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think we, you know, I think what we do has a purpose, which is to... you know, get to know 
the various political arguments and, and political people, and then to, to make a kind of synthesis of what we see, you know, because most people don't have the time to hang out at Westminster or read government documents or, or listen to speeches in full. And, and so what we have to pray see that, but I think it's much better if we try and pray see that fairly. It, is what you're describing there in terms of what's changing, it, it, is there a failure here of Ofcom to say that actually, how is it that we can have certain news channels where there is a, a plethora of conservative MPs doing, you know, broadcasting and whether that's balanced out? I think, Ofcom is under a lot of pressure and I mean, their get out is that you keep news as in news bulletins sacrosanct, mm. but you can have much greater freedoms in what they call current affairs. And that includes things like the, the Jacob Rees-Mogg show and all the rest of it. I think that it is regrettable that Ofcom has not been firmer defending the culture of the traditional ecology of, of, of British television. However, I understand entirely where they're coming from in the sense that everyone wants to talk about diversity um, and um, Ofcom, which now regulates the BBC as well, does not want to be seen as the protector of the establishment mainstream media and therefore wants to be open to new experiments. And I, and I do think as the number of voices increase uh, because the technology permits it, it, it's more and more difficult. You, you, know, you can't put everyone in the same straitjacket. So I, I, you know, I think some of the things they've done are regrettable, but I can see why it happened. I sympathize with that. One interesting thing I also find, um, and, and you have mentioned this, is the idea of of what role journalists have in the perception of bias, because there are num a number of journalists who do go into politics or who start to become more vocal in their opinions, having pre previously worked somewhere like the BBC, or for example, Allegra Stratton, who works at ITV News and BBC and then worked for Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson. You find that regrettable? I do, yeah. Do you think it should stop? I don't think you can ever stop it. And yeah. I think in a free country, people you know do move between jobs. They can, I, I do think you could, does it make a mockery of impartiality? If, if someone says, oh, well, I wasn't partial for 20 odd years, but now I've gone to work for a certain party and I've forgotten all about that. Yeah, I think it does. Um, and, and my answer is, I think it should be a one way channel. In other words, if you move from, you know, the BBC or ITV or, or Sky into politics, that's your decision, but there should be absolutely no return. I mean, what I'm saying to a certain extent is that everyone has to set their own standards. Mm. But I think if ITV or Sky or the BBC clearly state their standards and uphold them, I think in the long run, that will be good for them. Because in the end, I think all they've got to sell different from everyone else's trust. I guess my final question would be that, you know, for now, the Gary Lineker saga is sort of over, but there is this review into the guidelines. The right wing newspapers are sort of saying, this could be the nail in the coffin for the license fee. You know, this isn't over. For the future of, of, of what you have worked for, for that impartial journalism, how important is the maintaining of the BBC license fee? I do think um, that Rishi Sunak has played a part in how this situation has been resolved at the BBC. I think the fact that he has declined to give wholehearted backing to Richard Sharp, the fact that he said that Gary Lineker is a matter for the BBC and has not criticized Gary Lineker personally, unlike serving and previous current, um, cabinet ministers. I think that probably sent out a signal to, um, Tim Davey that, you know, he could afford to, back down a bit and, and, and do a bit of a U-turn. I think as far as the license fee goes, and we've, we've also had, you know, under Rishi Sunak, the decision is not to proceed with the uh, privatization of Channel 4. Um, and the licensee is continuing in, in, in the short term. I think clearly there are questions and will continue to be questions about state funding for a broadcaster.
I think it's only possible to maintain that, whether it's through a license fee or some other subvention, if that broadcaster is seen to stand aside or to be impartial in terms of, of the information it's providing, which I think it is. I feel that the BBC is the cornerstone of the ecology which you and I work in, which I think is a good ecology, which I think in the electronic media serves the public better than, for example, in the United States. So, you know, I, I think it's something worth preserving, but as technology evolves, as society evolves, you clearly have to have questions both about how it's paid for and ultimately whether you need it. But right now, I think we still need it much that we might criticise an awful lot of what it does. Adam Bolton, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure.